Classical music has a problem. A big problem. Concert attendance has dropped by 30% in recent years. Many events have less than half their seats filled. Even regular concert goers only average three to four events per year. The internet has made classical music more accessible than ever, but this hasn't translated into increased live attendance. And while classical music is more accessible than ever, it only takes 1% of the total billboard market share in the US. And that's fallen from 3% in 2009, putting classical music 12th out of the 12 major genres. The thing is, if this downward trend continues, arts institutions become less and less financially viable. Without revenue, these institutions risk a devastating cycle of reduced funding and support. And that could mean fewer orchestras, less new music, and in the long term, our classical music culture could just fade away. Sometimes it feels like watching the slow death of my favourite thing in the world. Is there a solution? I've uncovered several groundbreaking strategies, many of them from industry professionals in the trenches, that could turn the tides for this incredible art form. I'm going to show you a radical plan to save classical music. I went to a concert recently where there are about a hundred school kids in attendance, and many of them happened to be from my old high school. The repertoire was Shostakovich's Ninth Symphony, which, to be honest, is not the most straightforward piece for newcomers. The concert was masterfully played by a world-class orchestra, but when I approached my old school afterwards to ask how they enjoyed it, the kids looked pale. I found out they didn't even know who Shostakovich was. They didn't know what a symphony was. They didn't know the context or the period of music. They just didn't really know what they were listening to. And I thought, here are dozens of impressionable kids who, because of this negative experience, may never go to a concert again. What a great shame. But isn't this the same experience that thousands of new concert goers go through every single year? The first major problem now is education. A study by the University of Sussex suggests that music in secondary schools is at significant risk of disappearing. Year by year, fewer and fewer schools across the UK even offer to teach music as a subject beyond an elementary level. And this seems to be a trend across other countries too. But the problem is, while education standards have dropped, our concert culture hasn't really changed to reflect this. If a hundred kids can leave a Shostakovich concert not knowing who Shostakovich was, or even what a symphony is, then it's no surprise that they had a negative experience. In my personal experience, simply knowing about the music I'm going to listen to, and knowing something about how to listen to that kind of music, has always had a direct impact on my enjoyment of a concert. But I'll say more on that in a moment. Another issue is time. When I was still at high school, I used to come home and listen to an entire piece of music start to finish, just to unwind. And because of that habit, I used to impress my other musician friends with a ridiculous knowledge of repertoire. And that's because I used to actively listen to so much new music. But I am certain that most of my musical discovery happened between the ages of 15 and 19, because I was the proud owner of a Nokia brick phone. Recently, I realised that I just don't listen like that anymore, and I actually miss it. But I think that the modern rush of endless short-form stimulation is part of the reason. I'm sure that if I were a teenager in today's age, I would never have listened to half as much music. With smartphones and constant access to overstimulation, classical music fights an attention economy which is literally built on the need to get consumers addicted. I don't think anyone would disagree that social media and smartphones have encroached on the way we experience leisure time, and they've made people trend towards bursts of short-form entertainment over longer-form leisure. Classical pieces are typically quite long, but more than that, I found that they're enjoyed best when they're really listen to, rather than just heard in the background. When you sit there and get lost in the tapestry of what the music's trying to say. But the addiction that social media causes means that you're always feeling that anxiety to check your phone, and that stops you from reading a long book or listening to a long piece of music. Then there's recording overwhelm. Years ago, I surveyed a Reddit audience of music lovers, and I asked why they didn't listen to more classical music. A surprising number of people said they were interested, but they were overwhelmed by the sheer number of recordings. Where do they start? And which recording do they choose? We can tell newcomers to go listen to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, but there's hundreds of recordings of Beethoven's Fifth. It fascinated me that many actually find this choice 
overwhelming that there's no definitive version of a piece of music, as there is with, say, a pop album. On that note, I think the technological revolution of switching from CDs to streaming has also had an interesting effect. Streaming does give us more access to music than ever, but there was something about having a CD that actually committed you to listening to the full piece of music. Maybe multiple times. Maybe you'd even read the booklet, learn more about the music, the conductor, the ensemble. For many, that way of listening is no longer the case. Classical music faces an image problem. In the UK, at least, we are fighting a national consciousness where many think of this music as posh, elitist, or exclusive. It's hard to pinpoint what exactly made this happen, though Taruskin argues it was part of the social revolution of the 60s, an us versus them kind of thing, where somehow classical music was labelled as the establishment, and in opposition to anti-establishment rock music. This has never been my experience. Classical music for me complements a holistic musical life. But the image problem still prevails. And I think part of that image problem might be because people give concerts a try, they're given no clue as to what's going on, what they're listening to, and they're made to feel like they don't get it and aren't welcome. And so therefore, it must be for some exclusive group who are in the know. And I've also met people who are afraid to come to concerts because, for example, they literally don't know what to wear, or they're worried about how they have to behave. I met someone recently who thought that you had to wear dinner jackets or ball gowns to go to a concert, and they were afraid to go because they were worried they'd be out of place amongst a sea of posh people. Somehow, classical music has developed that public image, even though in my experience it's completely untrue at all except for the fanciest events. There's also the undeniable difficulty of some modern music, especially for newcomers. In 1958, as art or anti art was going wild all over the world, there was a lot of public dissatisfaction with how inaccessible modern music was. In response to this public outcry, the composer Milton Babbitt wrote the article who cares if you listen? This attitude, in my opinion, is not a great way to encourage new listeners to come and hear art music. Nor is giving the finger to your audience a great way to foster much excitement about new music. It's possible that that era of musical experimentation may have had quite a lasting impact on the public image of new classical music. So, that's a lot of problems. Let's take a deep breath and talk about some solutions. Aubrey Burgauer works on the business side of performing arts, helping institutions to build lasting connections with new audiences, and she's achieved consistently impressive results with a staggering increase in concert attendance for the orchestras she's worked with. In the very first chapter of Burgauer's book, Run It Like a Business, she says the problem isn't getting new people to come to concerts. In fact, thousands of patrons come to the arts every single year. The real problem with classical music is getting them to come back. Thousands are willing to give this experience a try, but it seems like so many have such a negative experience that their first experience is also their final experience. This can reframe how we think about the entire problem. The problem isn't getting people to come, it's getting them to come back. If we can give them amazing first experiences and find ways of nurturing newcomers, then there is strong hope for the future. And Bergauer's strategy hinges on this principle. But there's another very interesting data point here. Bergauer says that the product, that is, the concert itself, doesn't need changing. We don't need to install fancy light shows or break dancing or screens or rap to bring in new audiences. The product is already great. Rather, it's the packaging, what goes on beyond the main event, that needs changing. By and large, audience members don't want you to tamper with the core experience of the concert itself. The musical performance is already excellent, and Bergauer says that that's not what's keeping new audience from coming in. The issue is the packaging. So what does that mean, and how do we change that packaging? First comes education. And I mean that literally. Without education, every other initiative is pretty much pointless. But not only education, engaging education. And education is not a matter of dumbing down, but of raising the standards of engagement. We need to level up how we deliver engaging education. And in some institutions, that's already being done, even if inconsistently. 
One of the best, most engaging concerts I went to last year was The Rite of Spring, played by the Aurora Orchestra at the BBC Proms. And the reason it was so brilliant was because of the packaging. In the first half, the orchestra, the conductor, and two actors came on stage, and they told the whole story of The Rite of Spring. At times, the actors would play Stravinsky and Diaghilev, and at other times, the dancers and choreographers, and at other times, they'd play the outraged audience from the first performance. At times, the conductor would have the entire audience sing Russian folk songs. And then the orchestra would play excerpts and even break down bits of music instrument by instrument to show us how extraordinary Stravinsky's creation was. It was totally thrilling and engaging. And even as someone who's heard the piece 30 times before, I was still hugely engaged. I didn't once feel patronized. I felt invigorated. Then, in the second half, they played the piece from start to finish in the typical concert format. But having been given all that context and engaging education in the first half, the second half was totally thrilling. The first half fully primed us to get maximum enjoyment from the second half. And The Rite of Spring is a challenging piece for newcomers, yet with this presentation before the piece, I know that so many newcomers would have loved that experience. My only regret was that I didn't bring more newcomers to that concert, and that for some reason the BBC didn't capture it on film. In the 60s and 70s, Leonard Bernstein's Young People's Concerts were immensely popular because they welcomed newcomers and they had an inspiring figure talk about great music before having that music performed. And even if his audience was young, Bernstein did not talk down to them, but rather inspired them and excited them. We need more Bernsteins, more charismatic heroes that are willing to get on stage, enthuse and inspire new audiences without being patronizing. Forget the old-fashioned academic pre-concert talk. Modern students of the social media age need more engagement, and in this sense, the Aurora Orchestra's concert was exemplary. Now, of course, we can't do this with every concert, and we wouldn't want to, but education can go far beyond this. Bergau believes that education can happen in the marketing stage, before tickets are even sold. If you teach people about the music first, in a way that is compelling and exciting, it makes people want to come to a concert. Education as marketing is a brilliant idea, and it hits two toddlers with one snowball, because it means we get to deliver classical music education and we get to sell more tickets. The presumption that modern audiences know about what they're coming to is killing the potential for new audiences. Actually, most people outside of our bubble don't know what a concerto is, or what a symphony is, or what a sonata is, or what the difference is between an oboe and a clarinet. We are blinded by the bias of having known things for too long. But our marketing and our social media content could help with this. What if institutions used their marketing and their social media not to repost memes, as one famous opera house does, but to inspire and excite them with engaging education. Even on the smallest level, education can make a difference. A short 30 to 60 second introduction to a piece can make a huge difference. Don't presume that people will read the program or even buy the program, but a short pre-concert speech, when prepared and delivered well, can make a big difference to how someone listens to and connects with a piece. Education is even about setting expectations, that it's normal sometimes to feel a bit lost in a piece of music, to zone out and then zone back in. When I was young, I had the willingness to occasionally feel a bit lost without letting that be a negative experience. But some people may experience that and think, I didn't get that, so this isn't for me. And so they drop it too soon. Us musicians can communicate those expectations. I mean, you could even use screens to educate for special educational concerts. Screens saying, this is the main theme. Now, here it is being developed. I didn't even learn about theme and development until I was 15 years old, and it made the biggest difference to how I connected with music. And that's how about 95% of classical music works. That's how I got into music, and that's why I started this channel with videos on Lord of the Rings and Star Wars. It's theme and development. But it's our arrogance and our blindness that makes us presume that other people get it too. They don't automatically get it. They deserve guidance, and it's our job to guide them and make them feel excited about it. So engaging education has to be the first and most important answer. So how do we implement this? Each season, I would establish a series of four to six concerts, especially for newcomers, kind of like the Bernstein Young People's Concerts or the Aurora Writer Spring Concert, a series of concerts that welcomes newcomers and engages them 
without patronising them. And with those concerts, have a campaign which encourages current patrons to bring five new friends specifically to these newcomer-friendly concerts, where they will learn about the music and have it broken down in engaging and immersive ways. And then have follow-up concerts for these new members. Don't expect them to come for the hardcore stuff just yet. They need nurturing, just like anyone new to this art form. Don't assume they know what they're buying yet. Help them to make those purchasing decisions in your marketing, on your website, and so on. Then beyond that, for all your concerts, use a chunk of your marketing budget to deliver engaging education before the concert. Educate them through your advertising, through your social media, and so on. Establish engaging, inspiring education in the marketing, which if done correctly, will make those newcomers want to buy tickets. What I'm really saying is, if schools aren't going to deliver a great music education, then that becomes our responsibility. Next, whether we like it or not, connecting the audience with the artist is an important part of the modern music experience. For now, social media is an undeniable force. We'd be a little crazy not to use it, but how should we use it? Artists such as Ray Chen set a strong example. He uses content to inspire or enthuse about his craft without demeaning the art. By building an audience, people feel connected to him beyond just his playing. And because of that, when he was performing in my favourite hall recently, the auditorium was flooded with a sea of excited young people looking forward to seeing him play. A far cry from the ocean of white hair that I normally see. Now some may feel that this celebrity culture demeans the factor of pure skill and talent, and there may be some truth to that. But this is just one of the many ways of engaging and exciting new audiences to actually show up and watch them live. People want to feel connected to the soloists, the players, and the composers too. Even just a little bit about their life and what they do on a day-to-day -day basis can make a huge difference. For those orchestra players who are willing to get on social media, getting to see a day in the life of a cellist or a bassoonist can add so much context, humanity and excitement to the experience and the anticipation of a concert. And as Bergauer has found, the more you engage with new audiences, actually engage in human ways, the more they show up. In other words, find better ways to make content that engage ages, educates, and inspires a new generation of people. Now as for contemporary, modern classical music, there's so much amazing music being written right now. But there's no denying that the Milton Babbitt era took some toll on the general public. That era is mostly in the past, but it still exists in the public's consciousness. So how do we respond to that? Well, I think an attitude of caring about the audience's experience can go a long way. Remembering that you're not just composing for you, but for them, and for the concert event too. What you're doing is art, yes, but it's also a moral service. You can have your own musical voice and still care about making music that serves the event and the audience. And this isn't just about the music you write, but about the way it's presented too. Think about the audience's experience when they hear your piece. Do they know anything about it? Anything about you? About how you wrote it? Do they need some preparation for this experience? Is it going to gel with the other repertoire? And is it going to enhance the experience of the event? I know this may be controversial to a certain bubble of composers, but taking some time to engage and connect with your audience and trying to see the experience from their shoes can go a very long way. Now as for the image problem, this one is tricky and I do think that marketing and social media can go a long way to solving that. But Bogawa says that, again, the problem isn't necessarily the fanciness of certain events. The problem is the unknown expectation. Many people literally don't know what's expected of them. Just for context, the last 20 or so concerts I went to I was wearing jeans, and I did not stand out. I know that some cultures and halls may operate differently, but that's the point. The problem isn't dressing up. People like to dress up sometimes. You need to make the expectation clear. People just don't know. And because they don't know, the general public fills in the blanks with historical precedents that can seem strict and imposing. At the end of the day, when people go to these events, they want to feel like they fit in and that they are welcome. If they need to dress up, they are happy to dress up. They just want to know in advance so they can feel like they fit in. When people are informed of what to expect, that helps put them at ease. It helps make them feel welcome and avoids any risk of embarrassment. From websites to social media to the marketing, every touchpoint should say, you are welcome. Here's what to expect. Here's how the event will work. 
and here's what you need to know. At the end of the day, all that I've just said is different forms of engaging education. It's something I've tried to achieve on YouTube, one man army though I may be sometimes, and many other channels are trying to do the same. But if concerts want to sell tickets, then this needs to happen on a far more systemic approach. This is something that champions like Bergauer are doing, but it must happen at a wider scale if we are to help this art form to thrive. We all love the music, but I certainly needed some education and nurturing before I got it, and my life changed forever. So do thousands and thousands of other people. And music does change lives, and they deserve that experience. The plan is simple, engaging education on a widespread scale, in your marketing, in your concert series, in your social media, in your technological innovations. That is what will make all the difference in the world. If you care about this art form, then it is your duty. And so I pass the mantle on to you.